Hello and welcome to the 10th installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to understand how we can use flags and variables to keep track of what events have already occurred within the game. This will allow us to implement things like storylines, hidden items, and much more. This is a topic that lots of people don't fully understand right off the bat, so I'll be making this video a little bit longer than usual to make sure I explain everything thoroughly for you. This video will be broken down into the following segments. What are flags and how should I use them? How do advanced maps script events work? And what are variables and how should I use them? Following these segments will be an application demonstration. In this final part, we will be creating a script which simulates a choose-your-starter situation. Right now you're seeing Professor Birch being chased by a Zigzagoon. Any experienced player should know that we're about to get ourselves into a battle. After we defeat the Zigzagoon, we're taken back to the Professor's lab. If we return to the area where he was being chased, there is no longer any action going on. Somehow, the game knows that we've already seen the event and is now allowing us to pass. How is this possible? The same idea is demonstrated when we pick up an item off the ground. Once we pick it up, it disappears and never comes back. The game somehow knows exactly what events have taken place in the past and responds accordingly for future playtime. These two scenarios highlight the existence of what we call flags and variables. We'll start by talking about flags. Flags are used when we only want an event to occur once or after a certain point in the storyline is reached. There are lots of flags in the game and each flag is represented by a hexadecimal value. For example, we might say that flag 0x860 is used for triggering a menu item to show up or that flag 0x266 is used for deciding if an egg is currently sitting in the daycare. To give you a sense of how flags are incorporated, take a look at this list. As you can see, flags are used for all kinds of record keeping things, like keeping track of which badges have been obtained, which rocks have been smashed in the overworld, which trainers have been already battled and defeated, and many others. After hearing these uses, you should have noticed that every single instance of a flag use can be attributed to an on or off state. You either have the badge or you don't. You have either battled and defeated the trainer or you haven't. This is the main idea I want you to keep in mind. If you open advanced map and click on an NPC, you should see a box reserved for the person's ID. This value represents a flag. Whenever you see a person event with a flag associated with it, you can safely assume that said person event isn't going to be a permanent NPC. It's going to appear and disappear as its associated flag is set or cleared in a script. Take Professor Birch for example, he has a flag associated with him. We also know that he doesn't stick around for the entire duration of the game. This is because his flag is set after we save him from the wild Zigzagoon. This even applies to items lying on the ground. Once they're picked up, they disappear. We can see that they also have a flag associated with them. So, the item's flag must be set when we pick it up, making it disappear forever. Of course, not all flags make something disappear or reappear. Some are just used for record keeping. Shown on screen is a script in which an NPC gives us a Pokeball. This is just like how we wrote our scripts last tutorial. However, what if we don't want the player to be able to get more and more Pokeballs by talking to the NPC over and over again? We can use a flag to solve this issue. We need to make sure the flag we're using isn't already being taken by something else within the game. Using flags that already have a purpose may screw up the save file in unpredictable ways. If you're hacking Fire Red, only use the flags 0x200 through 0x2ff. These are safe to use and aren't important elsewhere. I couldn't find a list of safe flags for Ruby and Emerald hackers, but I did manage to find an incomplete list of flags that aren't safe to use. I'll post a link in the description of this video if you'd like to take a look at those. I suggest using flags that aren't in that list, but I won't be held responsible if you use a flag that has adverse effects on your game. Back to the script. After the give item command, type set flag 0x200. In addition to the NPC giving us an item, a flag will be set letting us know for future reference that the player has already received the item. After the face player command, insert check flag 0x200. On the next line, insert if 0x1 go to at already received. This bit of code will check if the flag 0x200 has been triggered. That is, it will check if the player has already been given the Pokeball. 
If so, the script won't give the player anything and skip to the at already received pointer section. Let's whip up a message under this new section that has the NPC say, you can't have another one, then end the script. Let's go back over this script so we know exactly what's going on. On the first interaction with this particular NPC, the script will check if the flag 0x200 has already been set. If it hasn't, the script will continue and the player will be given a Pokeball. Flag 0x200 will then be set and the script will end. On the second interaction with the NPC, the script will check if the flag 0x200 has already been set. It has, so the script will jump to the at already received pointer section, where the NPC will refuse to give us another item and the script will end. Viewing the result in game, we can see that the player is indeed given a Pokeball on the first interaction. Speaking to the NPC again, however, does not result in us getting anything. Let's make another script utilizing flags. First we're going to interact with an NPC. This NPC will then say, I was never here, then suddenly disappear, never to return. I've already written the dialogue part. After the message box command, type fade screen 0x1. The fade screen command fades the screen from one state to another. There are four values you can use for this. Value 0x0 will change a black screen back into the normal view. 0x1 will change the normal view into a black screen. 0x2 will change a white screen back into the normal view. And finally, 0x3 will change the normal view into a white screen. After we fade the screen into darkness, type hide sprite and then the hexadecimal value of the NPC as shown in the advanced map in the person event number box. In my case, this value would be 0x4. This command will make the sprite disappear. Next, type set flag 0x201, which is the flag value we're going to designate to this particular character. Now all we have to do to complete the animation is fade the screen from black to normal with the 0x0 value, then end the script. Back in advanced map, insert the value 0201 into the NPC's person ID box. This tells the game that once flag 0x201 is set, this character will no longer be loaded onto the map. Viewing the result in game, the NPC says I was never here. Then the screen fades to darkness. Within this darkness, the NPC disappears and flag 201 is set. The screen fades back to normal view and the script ends. If we ever want this NPC to show up again, we can use the clear flag command in some other script. This will reset flag 201, allowing us to speak to this NPC and start the process all over again. In addition to safe flags that aren't already being used, some special flags exist that you should know about. The values of these flags vary across the Gen 3 games, so I'll put a link to them in the description of this video. Some of these special flags include displaying badges and activating the running shoes. Let's move on to script boxes and variables. I briefly talked about these in my first tutorial. Script events are used to stop the player in his or her tracks and trigger a script. An example of this includes Professor Oak stopping us from going out into the tall grass. Clicking on a green script tile in advanced map will let us see some important properties including a variable number, a variable value, and a script offset. Ignore the unknown values, they don't do anything. This has been researched extensively and concluded by members of the community. A variable is similar to a flag. Flags have two possible states, set or cleared. Variables, on the other hand, have many more possible states. Specifically, variables can be set to any value between 0x0 and 0xFFFF. This means that we can set a variable to any of 65,536 values. We can use variables just like flags to see what events have already occurred and what their outcomes were. To give you a better idea of how we can check variables and make decisions off of their values, recall the compare last result 0x1 command that we've been using to check if the player chose yes during a yes or no question. Have you ever wondered what the macro last result actually is? It's just a variable. Variables are named similarly to flags. When we talk about a variable, we might say variable 0x2016 or variable 0x0010. Instead of using the word last result, we could write the line like so. Compare 0x 
800D0x1. Last result is just an alias or macro of the value 0x800D, which is designated to keeping track of some previous outcomes. Now that you know last result is just a variable, do you see what's actually happening with this compare command? We're comparing the variable 0x800D with the value 0x1. In other words, we're checking if variable 0x800D stores the value 0x1. If it does, we react accordingly. If it doesn't, we also react accordingly. Simple as that. This brings me to my next point. Just like how we have a limited amount of flags we can utilize, we also have a limited amount of variables. If you're hacking fire red, variables 0x4011 through 0x40ff are safe to use. If you're hacking ruby or emerald, I don't have much information for you, unfortunately. I've seen a couple posts saying that the safe variables in ruby and emerald are mostly the same as in fire red, but I can't guarantee anything. My suggestion would be to check which variables other hacks have used and stick to those. Now that we know more about variables, let's jump back into advanced map. As I've already mentioned, every script event has both a variable number and a value. The important part is this. A script event will only activate if the variable number stores the variable value shown in advanced map. Every one of our safe variables will start by storing a value of 0x0. Let's say we have a script event with the variable number 0x4057 as shown on screen and a variable value of 0x0. If we write a script in XSE that changes the value stored in variable 0x4057 to something other than 0x0, this script event will no longer activate when stepped on. This is a key concept. Similar to how we can set and clear flags to simulate a storyline, we can manipulate variable values to simulate the same effect. The only real difference is that flags are used for hiding and showing NPCs, while variables are used to toggle scripts on and off. That was a lot of information, but it should become more clear as you get more practice in. Let's write a script that incorporates a variable. We're going to make an event where the player is stopped from going into a building by an NPC. After the player speaks to said NPC, the script event will be toggled off, allowing the player to pass. This implies that we're going to need to write two separate scripts, one for the script event and one for the person event. Shown on screen is the script event script. When the player walks in front of the building, he or she is stopped with the lock command. We can't use the face player command since this script was initiated from a script event instead of a person event, so instead we use the command sprite face. Two parameters are needed, the first being the person event number that we want to target, and the second being the direction we want the NPC to face. The value 0x1 denotes down, 0x2 denotes up, 0x3 is left, and 0x4 is right. The second sprite face command has a person event number of 0xff. This 0xff value is used whenever we want to target the player instead of an NPC. The NPC then says, if you wish to enter, you must first speak to me. We then use the apply movement command to make the player step away from the door of the building. I won't go into detail with this command since we're going to cover it in an upcoming tutorial. The script then officially ends. Let's compile this script and place its offset in the script events script offset box. We'll use the variable 0x4011 and a value of 0x0. This means that this event will only activate while the variable 0x4011 stores a value of 0x0. By default, it does store this value, so we can be sure that this script will indeed activate when we step on it. The NPC's script is shown on screen. When the player interacts with her, she'll say, you may now enter the building. After that, we need to store some value other than 0x0 in the variable 0x4011. If we do this, the script event will no longer activate when the player steps on it, thus no longer stopping the player from walking into the building. All we have to do to achieve this is use the command set var 0x4011 0x1. This will set the value stored in the variable 0x4011 to 0x1. 
which is different than the previously stored value of 0x0. Let's assign this script to the NPC, then test everything out in game. As we walk up to the door of the building, both the player and the NPC face each other, and then the NPC tells us that we need to speak with her before entering. The player then takes a step back and is released. Interacting with the NPC allows us to successfully pass into the building. Just like with flags, if we ever wanted this whole event to repeat itself, we could just set the value stored in variable 0x4011 back to 0x0 with the setVar command. That's everything I wanted to cover in this tutorial. It was quite complex, but full of super important information. We'll be able to create some really awesome events from here on out. Using the information we've learned, we will create a script that simulates a choose your starter event, complete with disappearing Pokeballs. There are two things I want to discuss during this application demonstration. The first is the show PokePick and hide PokePick commands. When you're picking your starter in the original games, an image of each starter Pokemon will appear on screen when you interact with its respective Pokeball. I'm going to implement this detail into the script that's being written on the screen right now using the show PokePick command. Show PokePick comes with three parameters. The first is the hex value of the Pokemon you wish to display a picture of. You can find these hex values in my last video's description. The second and third parameters take the screen coordinates of where you want the picture to be displayed. I'll be using a width value of 0xA and a height value of 0x3. These values will properly align the image on the center of the screen. When we're done displaying the image, we need to use the hide pokepick command to get rid of it. This command takes no parameters, thankfully. In addition to the pokepick commands, I'll also be utilizing the pause command. Pause simply delays script execution for a specified amount of time. It takes a hex value indicating the duration of the delay. To give you an idea of how long a delay lasts for, using the value 0x30 in the pause command is approximately equal to one second in real time. The second thing I want to discuss is the probable length of this series. I explained in my introduction video that it's currently summer break for me, which gives me a lot of time to produce these tutorials. I said I plan to go over everything that a full-blown hack, if you will, incorporates to make it what it is. Unfortunately, this goal isn't going to be reached by the end of summer. It typically takes me about three to four days to finish a single tutorial. Knowing this, I'll only be able to get through a little more than 20 videos. I plan on scripting taking up until around the 20th video, so it's looking like I'm going to be able to get completely through the XSE scripting arc, but nothing more. This cuts off a lot of important topics like trainer sprites, overworld editing, and music hacking. I probably will not be able to make these videos once school begins. I don't know what the future holds regarding when or if I'll continue this series during holiday breaks or whenever but I'll make sure to give you guys a proper update as my expiration date draws near. We're about at the end of creating this script. Everything that went into making this has been taught to you through this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Poke Community or right here in my video's comment section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the 11th installment of this series.